Hi, my name is Chloe Chivers. I'm a second year linguistics student, and today I will be presenting the Ge'ez language from a historical linguistic viewpoint. I will start my presentation by introducing briefly the language as well as the area, and we'll continue by doing a synchronic description of Ge'ez, and I will finally end my presentation with the diachronic description of Ge'ez. So most of the languages spoken in Ethiopia and Eritrea pertain to the Afroasiatic family. Ge'ez belongs to its Semitic branch, more precisely the North Ethiosemitic branch. It's an ancient language that is considered extinct and is usually referred to as Old Ethiopic. However, it remained in use as the official written language until the 19th century, when the written use of Amharic, another Semitic language, was promoted in an attempt to modernize the country. The knowledge we have of the language derives from the vast literature written in Ge'ez. Inscriptions of Ge'ez have been dating to as early as the 5th century BC and were found in northern Ethiopia and Eritrea. It's the oldest attested member of the Ethiosemitic branch, so at first researchers believed that it, it, it was the proto-language of all Ethiosemitic languages, but today it's an assumption that is widely refuted. Nowadays, it's only used as the main language of liturgy, or lingua sacra, of the Ethiopian and Eritrean Orthodox Tewahedo churches, as well as in the Catholic churches and the Beta Israel Jewish community. It's used in prayer and in scheduled public celebrations. Therefore, the majority of the texts produced in Ge'ez are of a theological nature. Amharic and Tigrinya are now the main languages spoken by the Ethiopians and the Eritreans. They both share similar feature with Ge'ez and use the same writing system. The traditional classification of Ethiosemitic languages divides languages into North and South Ethiosemitic. North Ethiosemitic languages consist of Tigray, Tigrinya, and Ge'ez, and the South um, Ethiosemitic languages consist of Amharic and all other languages. However, that classification is criticized. Um, it's a classification by Hetzron, and it's considered inadequate, but it's also considered the most complete. The controversy arises regarding the origins of the North and South Ethiopic branches. Most linguists assume that they came from dialect clusters of Proto-Ethiopian, but others, such as Harold Crane Fleming, reject this assumption and suggest that South Ethiopian languages derived from Arabia independently. In this presentation, I will only mention aspects of the language that are specific to Semitic or uncommon to Indo-European languages, as I don't have the time required to do a full description of the language. I'll also provide transliterated examples, as they are simpler to understand than ones directly written in the script. All the examples used from, come from the literature mentioned in the bibliography. The Kingdom of Axum in today's northern Ethiopia, emerged around the first century CE. It was a major trading power in the region and had many international trade routes with the Greeks, the Romans, and ancient India. Its influence even spread to Eritrea and southern Arabia. Ge'ez was the language of the Aksumite Empire. It played a crucial role in the spread of Christianity in the region. The kingdom of Aksum eventually declined in the 7th and 8th century CE partly due to shifts in trade routes and the rise of Islamic power in the region. It's interesting to note that the word Ethiopia comes from Greek and was loaned to Amharic. It started being used around the 4th century CE. I'll start describing the language synchronically by mentioning its writing system. So the Ge'ez script is in Abu Gida, a writing system in which consonants are written with letters and vowels are indicated with diacritics or modifications to the consonant symbol. At first, the script was an abjad, where consonants were only represented. Vowel indications started to appear in the 4th century AD during the reign of King Ilxana, though it might have developed at an earlier date. In some languages, the script is called Fidal, which means alphabet and individual letters are referred to as Fidel. The original Ethiopic script contained 182 characters, but has now extended for other languages and contains over 500 symbols. There are 26 and more consonants, 
in which each have seven different forms corresponding to the different vowel sounds. They are called orders. Eight letters are borrowed from Amharic and Tigray in order to represent foreign sounds. Each of the first order consonants can be combined with one of the six vowels to produce a syllograph. The slide only shows you the first 10 consonants and their seven different forms as there isn't enough space to show the whole alphabet. Gaz is also written from left to right and there are no capital letters. Every word is separated by two dots and sentences end by doubling these two dots. A star-shaped series of dots can signal the end of paragraphs. Gaz is also used an alphabetical numeral system. The numbers aren't separated by the conventional two dots. Many texts were translated into Ge'ez and preserved by the Aksumites. There are a lot of translations or adaptations from the Greeks. As shown on the slides, the consonants are classified by French scholar Marius Chen in his book Grammaire Ethiopienne as gutturals, palatals, dentals, labials, sibilants, nasals, linguals, and semi-consonants. However, there is a more recent classification of Ge'ez consonants dating back to 2010. Linguist Stefan Wenninger provides a different classification as seen on the slides. He goes as far as providing the IPA, but mentioned that it isn't entirely trustworthy. I'm not capable of comparing both classification to each other, as one is written in the original script and the other isn't. According to linguist Thomas Lemden, most consonants offer no problems in pronunciation for English speakers. However, I'll restrain myself from pronouncing them since I'll most likely fail and do not want to mislead you. I've provided English counterparts on this slide. They come from Thomas Lambden's Introduction to Classical Ethiopian. There are additional sounds which are referred to in the book as gutturals. The two first ones are pronounced as glottal stops. The consonants t, d, s, and k have the common feature of glottalization. Lambden describes it as the flow of air being cut off completely at the glottis and the sound being made by a forcible ejection of the air already in the oral cavity. These sounds have a very sharp-like, click-like character, but once again, I will not intend them. The lab labialized sounds um, are simply pronounced simultaneously with a W, precisely like English uh, k and gu, as in quick or guam, and all of the consonants may occur simple or doubled. Um, Ge'ez distinguishes short and long vowels, which is a property of earlier Semitic, according to standard reconstruction. However, not all scholars accept it as a significant feature of the phonology. There are seven vowels as seen earlier. Here they are transliterated according to Lambden. So there are short vowels, which are A and E, and long vowels with the A Macron, E, U, E Macron, and O. The book provides approximations to the pronunciation of the vowels as seen on the slide. There is no evidence within the script of stress rules in the ancient period, but stress patterns exist within the litur liturgical traditions. According to Lambden, the vast majority of words may be described by two simple rules. All finite verbal forms without object suffixes are stressed on the next to last syllable, the sole exception is the second person feminine plural of the perfect in ken. And most other words, including nouns, adjectives, and adverbs, are stressed on the last syllable unless this ends in a final a, in which case the stress is on the preceding vowels. There are only a few exceptions to these rules, and they are in the pronominal system. Words in construct tend to lose their stress or retain only a secondary stress. There are a few uh, special phonological rules. Um, here are a few. The long vowels U and E may be shortened to E when the syllable in which they occur becomes doubly closed by the tradition, by the addition of the feminine ending T. This change is frequent in the case of U and rare in the case of E. Um, the long vowel A may remain in such positions or be shortened to A. The K 
of the verbal subject suffixes, as in ku, ka, ki, kum, ken, is regularly assimilated to preceding k or g. Um, as for the syntax and morphology, the main word order in ge's is verb, subject, or object, but it can be quite flexible. For example, um, in interrogative sentences, the subject and verb may switch positions, resulting in the verb, subject, object, word order. A common feature to Semitic languages is that most verbs, nouns, and adjectives have a triliteral or triconsonantal root system. The consonantal sequence is called the root of the set of words which share that sequence and can usually be assigned a meaning common to this set. The book gives an example of a set of words that share the common notion of ruling, um, which were with words meaning rule, reign, king, kingdom, um, and the consonants are classified regarding whether they are servile or radical letters. The latter are used to form the root of the words, and the former are used to indicate modifications such as gender and number. There are three basic lexical types of verbs related to the main triliteral root system. Lambden classifies them as such, according to the stem forms of the perfect that I'll mention later on. First, there are G verbs, which have a simple root, a stem vowel pattern, and they are the most numerous and uh, present the greatest variety in inflection. It is important to note that there is a distinction between two types of G verbs, the type represented by nabara, with an A between C2 and C3, and the type represented by gabra, with no vowel between C2 and C3. Um, secondly, there are D verbs, which have um, the doubling of the second radical and a stem vowel pattern, as in the example for he looked with the root that is uh, NSR. And finally, there are L verbs, which have a lengthening of the first stem vowel and a stem vowel pattern, um, as in the example for he blessed with a root of BRK. Ge's may also have quadrilateral roots, which have the pattern consonant, uh, a consonant, consonant, a consonant in the perfect of the basic stem and are designated as Q verbs. Um, there might be confusion, whereas a verb classifies as an L or Q verb, because when the second radical of a quadrilateral root is a W or a Y, there is a regular contraction of... Um, I, I missed um, I missed the slide. I'm sorry. Um, so yes, uh, there is a regular contraction of al to o and i to e, and this resembles l verbs in having a long vowel in the first stem syllable, as well as following the same inflectional pattern. The Ethiopic perfect corresponds to the English simple past or present perfect. The pronominal subjects, uh, he, she, they, are included in the verb form itself and does not need to be expressed separately. I will not go into detail as the perfect declines itself in different types depending on the root of the words. Um, I, I will, however, mention a few noteworthy aspects. The inflectional suffixes of the perfect are the same for all type of verbs. Deviation from the norm may occur because of phonetic changes occasioned by the presence of gutturals or semi-vowels in the root. When the final consonant is a k or a g, the, the k of the personal ending is assimilated, um, as in the example for I went up. The doubling is clear in transliteration, but is not represented in the old Ethiopian alphabets. In the case of transitive verbs, the pronominal object is regularly suffixed directly to the verb. Gender marking is present in the agreements that exist between, for example, a noun and a modifying adjective, or between a noun subject and its verb. In general, gender usage is fixed only for nouns denoting human beings, where grammatical gender coincides with natural gender. Nearly all other nouns occur in either gender, 
It's important to note that gender usage varies from one text to another, as for example in Greek translation, where it may depend on the gender of the underlying Greek noun. Most adjectives are derived from verbs, and only a few are derived from nouns by the addition of the suffixes awi and ai. They denote of or pertaining to, um, such as medrawi, of the world. The adjectives derived from the verbs follow different constructions depending on which root of the verb the stem form is built upon. I've mentioned the internal changes that affect verbs in order for them to become adjectives. I'd like to add that in the case of adjectival predicates, the order is predicate plus subjects. In the example on the slide, the adjectival predicate is negated with an E. There are at least two states in ge's, absolute, which is the standard form of a word, noun, adjective, participle, or infinitive, in contrast to a modified form called the constrict state. Possession by a noun phrase is shown through the constrict state. In Old Ethiopian, this is formed by suffixing the a to the possessed noun, which is followed by the possessor, as in the example on the slides for the voice of the prophet or the name of the angel. Most nouns endings in E have their construct in E. Nouns ending with the long vowels E, A, and O remain unchanged in the construct. Um, the, construct of, the construct state of plural nouns is formed in exactly the same way. Nouns have two cases. The nominative, which is not marked, and the accusative, which is marked with the final a on both singular and plural nouns. There are a couple of ex exceptions, as um, when the final e is replaced by e, and final a, e, and o undergo no change. Uh, personal names and place names are either left unflected, uninflicted, or take the ending ha. Because a noun in construct already has an ending identical to that of the accusative case, there is no further change when such a noun is used as the direct object. Non-concannative morphology is also an important aspect of Semitic languages. It's when the root of consonants do not always appear in sequence within the word. Instead, vowels and other consonants are added, subtracted, or changed to indicate different meaning. An example of it are broken plurals. They are formed by changing the pattern of consonants and vowels inside the singular form, as you can see on the slides. Since there is a lot to say about morphology, I won't mention anything else. If you want to further your understanding of it, I encourage you to have a look at Lambden's introduction to classical Ethiopic. Now on to a diachronic description of Ge'ez. The origin of Semitic languages is not well known, and there are two main hypotheses, the Africanist view and traditional theory. The latter believes that some speakers migrated from Africa to Asia after some time the language developed distinct features in Asia and formed a proto-Semitic language. Then some speakers migrated once again from South Arabia to Northern Ethiopia and moved further down south. The Africanist view, on the contrary, states that the origin of Ethiosemitic languages is Africa. According to this proposal, Ethiosemitic is a descendant of the Afro-Asiatic language, which has been spoken in Africa in pre-Semitic era, before the expansion of the Semitic languages across Asia and North Africa. The supporters of these hypotheses provide two explanations. First, among six of the Afro-Asiatic subfamilies, Semitic, Cushitic, Omotic, Berber, Chadic, and Old Egyptian, only one is spoken in Asia, while all of them are spoken in Africa. Among these, three of them are spoken in Ethiopia, Semitic, Cushitic, and Omotic. Another reason is that more Semitic languages are spoken in Ethiopia, around 16, rather than other than, like, than in Asia. Almost all previous classification proposals relied on the historical comparative approaches, which aim to classify languages genealogically by comparing the related languages. Since Semitic languages have a complex history of contact between them, there are many geographically adjacent languages. A genealogy-based classification is practically unachievable. 
Indeed, the internal classification of ethiosemitic languages is not entirely accurate when comparing grammatical features, be it phonology, morphology, or syntax. Here are a few examples. In terms of word order, Old Ethiopian is closer to non-Ethiopic Semitic than to Tigray, Tigrinya, or any other Ethiopic languages. And if we consider equative clauses, Ge'ez and Tigray are closer to Arabic or Hebrew. However, it is important to keep in mind that influence from the neighboring languages isn't the only impeding factor to a genealogical classification. Languages undergo changes with or without influence, such as in the case of grammaticalization. Proto-Semitic is the hypothetical reconstructed proto-language ancestral to the Semitic languages. As said previously, Ge'ez was believed to be the common ancestor of the Ethiopian Semitic languages, but was argued against by linguists Robert Hetzron and others. Most modern languages of Ethiopia are assumed to be already spoken at the time of at the time Ge'ez was coming into existence. Furthermore, Ge'ez contains a number of innovations with respect to Semitic, not shared by Tigray and Tigrinya. So there are a number of aral influences. After the decline of the Aksumid Empire, the political and religious center moved to the south, where Ge'ez wasn't spoken, but other languages such as Tigrinya were. In the following centuries, the center moved again to the north. Therefore, Ge'ez was most likely influenced by these relocations. Ethiopian Semitic languages exhibit a number of aerial traits diffused from neighboring Cushitic languages. Several of these individual traits, however, are interconnected due to the borrowing of the subject-object-verb basic word-order patterns of Cushitic languages into the formerly verb-subject-object Ethiopian Semitic languages. Typologically, the orders noun postposition, verb auxiliary, relative clause head noun, and adjective noun are all correlated with and tend to co-occur with subject-object-verb order cross-linguistically. The existence of labiovelars in Ethiosemitic language is also considered to be of, of a Cushitic um, influence. Vocalized Ge'ez inscriptions and modern Ethiosemitic languages either possess them or have traces of them, whereas they are not attested in Semitic languages spoken outside of Ethiopia. In the case of the alphabet, um, the vowelless alphabet developed from a cursive version of the Sabaean alphabet, which is an ancient group of South Arabians. Through some, um, no, although some also believe it to have descended from Egyptian hieroglyphs, angular forms of the letters changed to rounded forms. In the fourth century, the representation of the seven vowels were introduced in the alphabet when the Aksumites converted to Christianity. In the case of loanwords, the Ethiopian Bible was originally translated from Greek but some words, especially names, do not always seem to have a Greek source. Some seem to come from Semitic languages, such as Hebrew. Whether the transmission of the names could have been accompanied by oral tradition through Jewish speakers of Amharic, or due to later revisions using Arabic models is unclear. However, there is evidence of Cushitic influence in Old Ethiopian vocabulary, especially in categories such as animals, plants and vegetables, parts of the body, instruments, and tools. It is difficult to ascertain which Cushitic language was the source of the borrowing. The examples provided on the slides are from Leslow. So since, um, so since Ge'ez is nowadays only spoken in specific religious contexts, it is a challenge to figure out its true pronunciation from when it was still in use in the Aksumid Empire. Furthermore, even the daily liturgical use is most probably incorrect, since it was very likely influenced by a number of factors, such as unavoidable language change or influence from neighboring languages. This poses a sin significant problem to historical linguists, since language reconstruction is done on the basis of phonology. Indeed, to testify of morphological change, for example, it is necessary to understand which phonemes were involved. The reconstruction of Old Ethiopian pronunciation rests heavily on the analysis of remaining literature. French linguist Marcel Cohen raises some of the limits regarding the use of these resources and in the 11th series of Journal Asiatique, 18e volume. Um, for example, in the script 
the absence of a vowel after a consonant is signaled the same way as the presence of an um, schwa, a freaking vowel in geese, which is confusing. There is no way to signal geminate consonants that are also frequently used in geese to signal grammatical concepts, and word stressed isn't marked. Thank you very much for um, listening to my pronunciation to my presentation. Um, this is the bibliography.